Welcome to the Dork Bajir Chronicles, where an expert and a new expert read through K.A. Applegate's stunning sci-fi serial, Animorphs. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us. Join us. Come on, get in here. Welcome to the Dork Bajir Chronicles, a podcast where we read through the Animorph series one book at a time and then talk about it every week. Today, we'll be talking about book number 52, The Sacrifice. I'm Tessa, the expert. And I'm Brayden, the almost expert. (gasps) Yeah. Brayden, three books after this one. How do you feel? (sighs) Well, um... You ready for the last three volumes i'm i'm feeling pretty good um you know the redacted redacted was a bit of a kick in the gut but uh at the same time like i mean redacted 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 redacted. i think a lot of um i'm bleeping all of this because (laughs) i don't need to listen to this on an animorphs podcast right right this is where we escape the real life by jumping into some oh yeah Our first piece of fan mail comes from Blake Brinkley at Blake Brinkley 31 on Twitter, who says, well, he asks, really, is it too late to change my answer to that beaver morph question? And he provides a link to a tweet that don't, no longer exists. I'm sorry, Blake Brinkley. I kind of remember that tweet. It was something about a beaver doing something. And it's from Johnny Sun. Our second piece of fan mail comes from Josh, son of Chris, at WritingsArt on Twitter, who tweeted at us this beautiful photo of a gorilla punching a grizzly bear and asked us, is this Rachel Co? <laughs> I, we quote, Dork Bajir quote tweeted it, and um, y'all, the way that the sun shines off of this powerful gorilla butt muscle, <laughs> though... Yeah. Uh, Daniel Alvarez chimes in at Mr. Dan Alvarez on Twitter. The ultimate couple. I said it. So thank you. Thank you, Daniel. <laughs> and our third piece of fan mail is Movie Polls replying to last week's episode. Because yeah. Movie Polls is the expert in our heart. Um, so apparently the ghostwriter of book 51 called the U S army to ask for details on the tank and stuff. <laughs> uh, I wonder if they ended up on some sort of watch list. Also, I never minded that the animorphs didn't know the gender or name of the governor Axe's response to their lack of information was funny, but book six animorphs, middle school kids knew so much about their state governor that book 51 veteran animorphs did not talks about in the capture the then 13 year old animorphs knew enough about their governor to know his gender his potential presidential candidacy and his eventual off the books medical operation because remember that's the whole reason why they went to the hospital in the first place before jake got yerked was because tom's yerk was going to end up in the governor was it going to be tom's year i'm pretty sure it was tom's yerk he was the one that was going to be promoted because that's who ended up infesting jake (laughs) Oh, man. Remember the days when they were talking about promotions in the Yerks? Right. Instead, we get book 52. I get to do the summary of this really fun book. Axe, Rachel, and James start off. They're scouting out their hometown city. They find out that the Yerks have started to round up people, stuff them on a train, and then take them to the Yerk pool for mass infestation. They've made new train lines that go directly to the Yerk pool. There's like seven train lines in total. Rachel, like, they see this, realize what's happening. Rachel immediately wants to put a stop to this and save these people. Axe doesn't think that's a good idea. There's only three of them. The Yerks will clearly annihilate them. And they also, there's more trains. They can't do any good doing this. James is like, what? But they're people. Don't you care? Axe is frustrated. Like, what? what, just because I'm not a human, you you think that I wouldn't care that they're alive? Like, I do care. But he wrestles with him being an Andalite and sticking out from the humans a lot in this book but he does that in every book and i just think it's really this is the uh first book that ka applegate uh wrote herself since book 32 yes right right the last of the ghost written books was last week this one is oh 
so fucking good. Yeah. I had a conversation with Movie Falls about this on Twitter. Um, there's a line where in the very beginning when Axe is like trying to talk about what they used to be. They used to be just kids, random kids that called themselves the Animorphs and then they rescued me in the ocean. Um, and then he talks, it's kind of, it's a little bit rambly and he talks about just bouncing between the past and the present. He says, I'm, I'm not very good at explaining. Prince Jake is much better at explaining. Yeah. I'll start over. Yurks are slugs that flatten into your brain. And then he goes into the whole thing. But that's kind of, that's just kind of where his headspace is at. Yeah. That's where his mind is at this whole time. That's where the kids' minds have been at the whole time in the last couple of books. They just keep, thoughts keep running through their head. They don't know what is true anymore they're falling more into their stereotypes that the what the group expects them to be mm -hmm. what one interesting point that i kind of noticed around this point was um they they do start discussing it much more seriously the idea of killing uh human and hork bajir and of course and and single and light controller um in a way that i thought was really bridged out of the question with a level of brutality um in book i believe it was uh the one where they get uh visor three alone in like a field and almost assassinate him or at least his body was, his andalite body um when the was the yerk inside his head or outside of outside, his head? outside that was book eight yes yeah. they decide not to do it specifically to spare um alaran um and i i, I feel like it's yeah. It's a testament to how long we've been go. Maybe it's a testament to like only how far that can go in fiction, being uh, like supermanning uh, everyone's life, or maybe it's a testament to how far they've come that they are willing to give that declaration up. Well, and I've always thought it was the second one. I literally just read something on Tumblr a couple of days ago that was this exact conversation about how the kids wanted to spare Lauren's life in book eight. If they had killed him then, so much wouldn't have happened. Yeah. They would have been able to avoid so much heartbreak. Like, but they didn't. And you know now that given any kind of chance, they totally would. And we wouldn't have more books. And then we wouldn't have more books. They just dramatically end. We'd have eight books, and then like maybe a ninth book where like Jake is like, oh, oh whose books come after Axes? Jake? Uh, Cassie. Cassie. We're just like Cassie is having like a job interview at a zoo. Yeah. And like kind of bombs it. <laughs> it's is very like nervous. A, it's like a Megamorphs book. Yeah. Um, where they just like because we've just had the first Megamorphs book in between book seven and book eight, and we have book eight, and then the end of the then the series is just like a Megamorphs book from all of their perspectives. Oh and my Jake god. Jake tries out for the basketball team, and Cassie wants to get a volunteer position there's, in the gardens. There's still fifty four books. They there's still like it just abruptly forty six more, but just a total change. <laughs> just like at the next book, they're just like it's cool that Axe got back to his home planet, and all the Yerks were arrested and tried <laughs> like how they write out love interests and in sequels yeah. to movies where they're just on the phone or just mentions like oh yeah no this i i didn't like that fbi agent who was all over you hot stuff so i shipped him off to antarctica <laughs> or like and that uh, way we can make weird devil babies together <laughs> or like in uh or like in an anime where like they start off with these really broad premises but then it like ends up turning into something like very thin and narrow just like, slice of life yeah it's just a coming yeah. of age slice of life story about teens with superpowers but no threat like how Yu-Gi-Oh was like all about this like shadowy like bastard king of games who like literally killed people by like playing dice with them or whatever but then like <laughs> by book five it's like my children's card game is very powerful instead in this book we have kids who actually go out to murder before they can escape, there's a bunch of peregrine falcons, which are actually yurks in morph, that attack the kids. Yeah. They try and escape by going into the train tunnel, demorph, remorph into, uh, they, you know, some good fighting morphs. They're battling peregrine falcons that are getting like shocked and electrocuted to death or chopped in half. Yeah. Axe holds one of them and he says, wait, wait, please don't kill me. I'm only like five minutes away from the end of the morph. I'll totally not let into the woods. I don't want to fight anymore. And Axe lets him go. And Rachel in Owl Morph kills him. Yes. She like, kills Axe and then the book is done. <laughs> and the book is done. It's very, it's just a lot of blank pages. Uh, no. kills the, the very kills last the, page just says yeah. fuck. Kills the peregrine falcon. He kills the peregrine, she kills the peregrine falcon. And um, they get back to camp, they share their information, and they try and think of a plan to deal 
with these trains. Yes. Uh, their only idea, Braden, you're gonna love this. Their only idea is to steal bombs Ugh. and put them on a train Ugh. and blow up the Yerk pool. <laughs> Cassie is obviously opposed to this. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh. Was it good for you? <laughs> You could say I fucking blew. <laughs> uh, Brayden, that joke sucked. <laughs> Cassie is obviously opposed to this. Um, when she first, th- so they have a conversation about, I kind of, I just read the, the book today, but I kind of forget the timeline. I think they have a conversation about blowing up the train. They don't really talk too far into it. Oh, it's, I think there was a big, it was a big town hall meeting and Jake sends everybody away. Axe sneaks out of camp in the raccoon morph. With the Z space transponder, and he phones home. He phones and- Andalite High Command, and the Andalite War Prince he's talking to says that Axe must tip off the Yerks, sabotage this bombs on a train plan, because the Andalite High Command has a plan for Yerk for Earth. What they want to do is they want the Yerks to win, and then they can hold up a white flag and safely quarantine Earth, which Axe totally knows that they're just going to make another Q virus. Yeah, it stands for quarantine virus. <laughs> it just puts everyone in a little bubble, like Bubble Boy. Like Bubble Boy. They're just all yeah. these, they're in full size human bodied condoms. The team discusses the bomb plan again. Cassie is like super against it. She keeps like saying, this is not how the way to go. Jake gets angry, kind of blows up at her, um, saying, how dare you think you know what's best for everyone? Now it comes to like Cassie's actions in book 50, where she is the one that let the Yurks have morphing power. Rachel is instantly pissed. Marco is like, what the fuck? Axe just feels hatred. Absolute, like, nani? Which is, I will share a moment of my own personal hatred where I deeply empathize with Axe because I felt hatred like that. I guess I'll just share that story now. I was playing the board game Ticket to Ride with my mom and my grandma. <laughs> and it, the turn went my mom, myself, and then my grandma. I had one, two train car route left to go, and then all of my routes would be connected into one long, super big mega route. And I chose to pick up cards and pad my hand instead of playing what I could have played. And my grandma went all the way over on the other side of the board were her trains. I did not think that my own grandmother would decide to put two trains in the one space I needed to put them. I felt like a drop of freezing cold mercury drip down my throat into my stomach and my chest. And I just got very still. And then I realized that I was seething with hatred for my grandma over a board game. And now I'm in therapy. But yeah, so I can Uh, empathize with Axe about this kind of uh, hatred. Yeah. (laughs) The Cassie is like shouting and crying and Jake just pulls her into a hug and says, it's okay, I forgive you. And they all just kind of move on from this moment in Axe's opinion. And he does not does not he's like you are all fucking children if this happened in the online homeworld she would be tried for treason and then murdered this sets up a very interesting um about face uh by the end of the book uh and also an interesting little thing that axe says at the end of the book that that we'll discuss when we get there that i found very interesting Right after this, Cassie, Axe pulls Cassie aside. She's like, oh, man, I already apologized to the group. Do I have to apologize to you, too? And he's like, no, this is fucking serious. Like, you don't get it. I literally actually want to kill you right now. Do you have any reason why you did this? He and Cassie have a conversation. She's like, I I really don't know. I just felt like it was the right thing. But, you know, maybe it could inspire the Yerks to escape, right? The ones that want to escape, they can escape. Remember the hork that sliced Visser once, uh tentacle when he was strangling jake back in book 50 like that came from the hork the blue band hork bajir on viscer one side like what if there's yurks that want to escape and axe is like uh actually i just dealt with the yurk that wanted to escape earlier awkward but out loud he's just like shut the fuck up shut the fuck up and you go don't away. know my fucking feelings oh you're not my mom uh axe like you're not my mom himself. anymore 
he like he has to think he has to and, and if you think about book eight again and that tender moment when cassie asked axe to come home and eat chili introducing him to spicy food Introducing him to spicy food, one of the best foods in the world. And also just, like, she knew he was lonely and she wanted to be there for him. Ah, oh, I love Cassie so much. Oh, my God. I love her so much. Axe has never had to take a spicy food shit. Damn. Yeah, fuck. He gets, he gets all I mean, he, the fucking... He might have at least once in for experimentation purposes. I don't know. Can... Food go through your bowels that fast? If he eats poisoned food, you know what? Axe probably ate <laughs> moldy, like, jalapenos. Oh. Just to get, like, the spiciness. And then also to immediately throw her diarrhea it up. Why are we talking about this? I don't know. Um, Axe leaves Cassie. He's thinking his own thoughts. Tobias comes and says, hey, yo, dude. Um... Hey, Unky. Just to let you know, I definitely saw you talking to the Andalite High Command. And Axe is like, what the fuck? He has already decided not to tell the, like, he he already omitted that the Yurks had morphing power in his earlier conversation. And now he decides that he's not going to, like, he's going to go against direct orders. He's not going to stand in the way of the train bomb plan. He's not going to tell them that, like, the, the humans are the ones that gave the Yurks morph capabilities. Yep. Can't um, violate the golden chain. He and, like, he and Cassie talk about what Alfanger would do. He and Tobias kind of talk about that. It's a really good moment here in the middle. And then they begin this fucking cool-ass mission. Like, it's this book. You can tell it's written by K.A. I, earlier I was like, it's so close. Like, it's so cl- Like, some of the, the later ghostwriters have yeah. been so fucking good that it's been really difficult to tell. But this one just kicks it up a little notch. Yeah. Like, there's a couple literary things in there. There's such strong characterization in the first half of the book. And then the second half of the book is all nonstop plot that's so exciting. Yeah. So this here's This is obviously a change of pace. Like, like this, is, this is in the hands of a master artiste. This is where I started thinking, like... Oh, how are they going to maintain the status quo, learn their lesson, and maintain the status quo this time? How are they going to not blow up this train station? Well, we'll find out. And they fucking do it anyway. So this is the train bomb mission. Everyone's involved. The parents are a decoy and approach National Guard trucks with a clever ruse. Oh, no, we were camping, and then we got lost, and please help us. I have chest pains. Um, They're adults, so they're immediately trustworthy. Yeah. They get put on trucks and taken to base camp with the Animorphs morphed flea and following and the auxiliary Animorphs' birds and following and Toby and her horkies in the trees and following. Everyone is there. They successfully knock out the guards, find the bombs, they start loading them into the trucks, but the alarms go off as soon as they move the crates. They only have these three trucks that were in their little convoy that when they got into camp, so that's all that they're using to load up with bombs. And then they're heading out for the gate. Rachel's driving the one in front with her mom and Axe and Human Morph. And the National Guard, like the rest of the National Guard, are there standing in their way. And the captain's standing in front and he holds out his hand to stop. Rachel's mom, Naomi, says, Rachel, you have to stop. And Rachel says, no. Axe says, I order you to stop. And Rachel says, no. The only thing that makes Rachel stop is Axe actually wrenching the steering wheel out of her arms. And then it goes to a stop ten feet away from the captain. And Naomi and Axe both say that, hey, like, I heard Axe order you to, like, I heard Jake order you to stop. You didn't hear it. Jake gets out of the truck and starts to talk to the guard. Axe comes out to demorph to prove that aliens are real. Naomi comes out of the truck and is like, hey, Paul, what's up? Remember how I got your kid out of jail because I'm a fucking excellent lawyer? Yeah. Well, I'm an adult and I believe this young boy and these aliens, so you should listen to them. Come on, Paul. Your kid had so much child porn. <laughs> they uh, trust the, these the captain. They it's revealed that the governor has been placed in. Um, well, we don't actually know what's happened to her, but they say she's in a rehab facility because of the mental breakdown she had on TV recently, where she talked about aliens existing. Um, orders from the captain's major are that this is a total like fake. What's happened? Don't go into the city. We've got you know everything under control. Jake's like that's not real. The captain's like you know what. You have an adult backing you up, and I believe her because she's a lawyer. How can we help? So they have five trucks now. Everybody knows people (laughs) love and trust lawyers, especially ones they've personally worked with. Yeah. 
Uh, they, I mean, if your lawyer, if your lawyer wins, then yes, you do. <laughs> um, if your lawyer's good. So now we know Naomi is a really fucking good lawyer. So they load up. There's five trucks now full of bombs um, and soldiers, and they get into town. They get into a train station, um, apprehend the guards. There's people that are on the train, like, already, but it stops at the train station, and everybody gets off. And the Animorphs start, like, they have to fight these huge, these yurt controllers there that start morphing wolves and polar bears. And uh, Jake's like, okay, everybody, we're going to wait until they're fully morphed. We fight the Yurks. We don't act like them. And it's like, okay, yeah, that's very good and noble, but also, fuck, it's a fucking polar bear. Just kill it. That's the largest land predator on Earth, Just kill it. Um, the soldiers help, and all of the Yurk controllers are dead. There's a bunch of dead wolves on the floor. Axe freaks out because he doesn't know if one of the wolves is Cassie. And then he turns and she's, sees that she's fine. And he realizes that he doesn't actually hate her and maybe never hated her at all. And she kind of gives him a look and like a smile like she knows this. They load bombs onto the train and they know they have to start taking off soon. Oh, they've decided on a compromise, by the way, for the bomb plan. What they're going to do is set a five minute timer and then warn everybody at the Yerk pool that the whole thing is going to blow in five minutes to kind of give them a chance to get away and survive. And that means that somebody has to be on the train as it crashes, flies through the air, and crashes into the yurt pool. Probably, definitely going to kill you. They need Jake to stay alive. They all tell Jake that. He says, I don't agree, but there's not enough time to argue. Axe, Cassie, and Marco, you're on the train. A couple blue bland hork- Blue bland? Blue Boo-bland. bland hork- They are hiding on the train, or they get onto the train. Somehow, Axe is so furious with himself. How the hell do we miss them? They fight the hork It doesn't take very long until they're both dead. Um, or they're all dead. There's a hawk that flies through the train windows, and it's... Uh, James, one of the auxiliaries, and Cassie screams, thanks, James. Axe decides he's going to be the one to punch in the timer at the very last second as the train is crashing, as the other ones speed morph into bugs. And Axe immediately says the, the the prayer, the ritual of his people when, like, I am the servant of the people. Like He says the one that you say when you're dying or when you're about to go mm-hmm. into a difficult battle. This one, sure always, one. this one always gets me kind of, like, pumped up, because I remember the one where they described, like, with the thought speak, like, all of the all of the soldiers on that one ship, like, saying it at once as they go into this final, like, for Valhalla they ride. It's, and it just... It's a very cinematic feeling. Like, you can just hear the music building in your head as he goes, I am a servant of the people. And just, ugh. I just hear, like, heavy guitar. Just... I feel almost... I hear almost like a, like or, a, bit, a bit more orchestral than that, but still, yeah. like, heavy guitar. Um, they speed like morph... Like Wheel of Time by Blind Guardian. They speed morph into bugs. They all happen to survive the impact into the yerk pool. Although Cassie, when she demorphs, she, like, is pulling a yerk out of her ear, which is ugh. disgusting. She stands on top of the train. Everyone thinks it's an accident. All the controllers are acting like it's an accident at first. So it takes a bit until Cassie gets their attention. And she shouts and she says it's going to blow up in five minutes. Or she says four minutes, really, to give them some more time. Um, everybody be out of here in four minutes. The They anamorph into, like, Marco Zagarella now. They start unlocking some of the human, like, the free human hosts that are in cages. A couple of human controllers stay back to help unlock. And this is further proof that... There are some human controllers that just want to avoid the war. Like, they would def- like they, they would escape if they could. Um, yeah, and the Yurks escape. Uh, or the, they all try and escape. They fly out. It blows up while they're birds. And they fly away on the hot draft. Oh, but before this, yes. we have... If I may play it right now. This is a fourth minute. This is a fourth minute. Three, three, three. Do you want to describe the quote from the book? <clears throat> Let me put on my Lovecraft voice. <clears throat> Twenty bloodshot eyes dotted the bulbous face. Twenty tentacles grew out from the bottom of the head, as large around as eels. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I think this is the one from the last book, too. Is this the, the octopus one from one? the last book? They, t- big bloodshot eyes, octopus-like. Was there, an, there wasn't, they didn't see Visser one in the last one. 
Uh, the last the, one okay. was when they met the gar- the governor. No, I don't. Right, right, I right. don't think the octopus one is the same one from last time. No, sorry, the one 50. where they got the the one where they got the auxiliary animorphs. Forty. Yeah, book fifty. I don't think they. I don't think this is the same one. I know it's a tentacled one. I think it's the letter fact in book fifty, isn't it? No, no, it is a. It's a. It's a. An octopus monster. Do they call it a letter thack? Do they not? Call I mean, it a he letter does thack? morph a letter thack in it book is... eleven, and I know that has lines. Let I... me Google it. Yeah. Unnamed squid, like it's more of a squid. Squid. So in book fifty, it's more of a squid. Okay. It's an unnamed squid like creature. This yeah. one's more of an octopus. So same, same, but different. Yeah. Um, yeah, this is a really he doesn't actually use it much. He morphs it and then gorillas <laughs> Marco's like, hey, fuck you. The place is gonna blow. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah, Marco is from New York. Marco's from New York. The book and A gorilla in New York. What the fuck? What the fuck? It's a nineties movie waiting to happen. Hey, I'm talking here. It's a talking gorilla. He never seen the last of it. So there's now a huge crater in downtown. The book ends with the kids as raptor morphs watching the aftermath. Marco says, this is easily our greatest victory ever. Why do I feel like shit, though? It's a true fact. They he does swear. say shit, though. And they, though spelled T-H-O. <laughs> they fly back to the Hork-Bajir Valley. He tweets it. Jake privately says thank you to Axe, who says Prince Jake to himself. Yeah. Uh, Axe also... Um, what I really feel is an interesting line. Um, he describes humans as confusing to him. They are a species of contrast. They love and they hate at the same time. They want peace. They want war at the same time. But, like, I don't know if he realizes by the end that these that's a quality that also describes himself. He wants to be an andalite and a human at the same time he wants to he hates and he loves cassie at the same time it's it's throughout this book i think most blatantly in his like outright stated hatred toward cassie and then very blatant non-hatred toward cassie but it is it is not only yeah not only even throughout this book throughout the entire series axe is Axe sees things in other people that he does not see in himself, but we do. He's not very self-aware, I think. And also, he's... Ugh, he's so pretty. Um, He says in this book that he's thrown his lot in with the humans, but you're totally right. Like, he's done this before. Like, it wasn't ever... For me, it wasn't really a surprise that he did, in the end, throw his lot in with the humans. Mm -hmm. I think this is just when he realized that he is more human than Andalite. Like, he only grew up in the Andalite homeworld. He has been, he's had more learning experiences. He's grown more as a person being here with the Animorphs in constant battle and just testing his wills. Like, I think it's mentioned in this book, or maybe the one um, coming after, about how, like, the kids, they, they faced more battles than most war veterans. They are so far beyond expert at this point at what they do. Like, no wonder he's feeling more human than andalite he hasn't talked like talked to an andalite since like, he hasn't seen an andalite in person since estrid in book 38 that was so long ago oh and he kissed her oh that probably got him so revved up and then just nothing happened with it oh he has been fighting with a he has been fighting 100 percent revved up ever since then i mean like he and marco hang out <laughs> so he's <laughs> He's gonna be fine. Um, I did not read this book much as a kid, and also I think I just read it too fast, or I didn't give myself time to really digest that this is the end of times. But like the, when I read it this time, it's really hitting yeah. me. The city is under military occupation. Maybe I just know what that means better as an adult because I've watched Avengers movies and I've seen it happen <laughs> in media a bajillion times. Also in real life. Also in real life. We lived through 9-11, Tessa. We don't live in the real life here. This is the Animorphs world. Right, right. Of course. You know, where 9-11 didn't happen. <laughs> Um, I mean, they never mentioned it in the books. I so... guess so. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> no. Um, yeah. So it's just like they're in. They're on the west coast. They don't give a shit. It's incredibly intense. The things that happen in this book. Yeah, this is really when it's real, y'all. Like people, they they are just like Cassie. 
just they'll just kill people they don't care like they talked about the dead wolves earlier yeah they kill a lot of hork and that increased over time but now it's just kind of like like it was such a, a slow acceleration almost for me again maybe it's because i read fast it was just such a slow acceleration in the amount of violence that now suddenly every all of the bad guys are just dead and they're walking over these corpses and still doing their job that's wild to me also, I want to mention this quote from from Axe Millie yeah. as Garoth is still. So this is when they're in the National Guard camp, and it's just after it's just after the captain of the guard agreed to like help them out and everything. Rachel goes up to and Rachel goes up to her mom to apologize for before her mom says, "Oh, honey, it's okay," and just gives her a big hug. And Rachel starts to cry, and Axe thinks perhaps Rachel, like me, suddenly realized that the gulf between the present and her childhood was an abyss of loss. That's so fucking oh, Nietzsche. That's so That's fucking... Nietzsche as fuck. Or maybe, Just... maybe it sounds more like a Kierkegaard thing. But the, the word abyss leads me to more Nietzschean, you know? Also, so they're saying goodbye to their parents as they start this, like mission to put the bombs onto the train. So the parents don't come along with that. And Marco just gives his dad a handshake. Well, yeah. Come on. Your dad's a touchy feely guy. Give he's him a, a fucking hug. He's a, he's a man now. He's got that mochismo. Also,. I don't know if you've picked up on this. We've never heard of Tuan before. Oh, um, I actually, I read the trivia on the Seropedia page. See, Tuan was Timmy's original name in some earlier versions of the, like, scripting of these books. Um, when it came right down to it, though, they decided, like, kids aren't gonna know Tuan is a fucking name. What is that? I, I, a, fu- a fucking Vietnam thing? Nah, nah, nah. We got veterans reading this. They'll fucking have flashbacks. Uh, or something like that. I don't know. Um, yeah, and then... it. So they changed, so they changed it, to, it Timmy, to Timmy. Um, and then... But in the script, the draft outline... Why did I call it a script? Because it... I went to film school, because I'm an asshole. Um... <laughs> they wrote down what they had written down Twan before but the they changed writer it. But the ghostwriter didn't yeah. read book fifty before yeah. this one, so they said Twan King. That's what I thought. That's definitely what I thought because Timmy had a bobcat morph, and also of all the names from last time, Timmy is the one that pushed it over the edge to make it sound fake. Timmy, because nobody calls their kid Timmy. You're yeah. only called Timmy if you're part of a McElroy bit, and that's it. <laughs> you only exist within the realm of comedy when people mention you. That's yeah. it. Also, so nobody says the governor's name at all, and that's because nobody paid attention in middle school. Nobody knows what the name is. Um, so we now know the the blind girl's name from book fifty. Yes, she's kind of been semi adopted by Marco's parents. At least she's with them. They're you need like to go back. Her. You need to go back, and you need to say semi instead of semi because that is a gay anime thing. <laughs> she's been semi adopted. Semi, you know, they're taking care of her. Um, do you want me to just do the whole bit again? Uh, we can keep this in. Okay. Um, I thought that was neat. She's more capable. She doesn't want to fight. Mm-hmm. She just did it to escape, but she can't leave, um, to be with her parents because she was there. That was when Tom, um, attacked, like, caught them and everything. So, now she lives here in the Horkshire Valley, and I'm, like, that's neat that they brought her back, but, like, man, poor Alina. I'm so sorry that you... I have an unfortunate life where you got dragged into this whole mess. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, I remember what I was going to say. Um, where the fuck is God and the devil? Like, we're two books from the ending ending, and, like, you think that two of the most major characters in the entire series would start playing more of a role at this point? You find out at the beginning of the next book that everything that happened in this book was just a dream put on by Cryak to <laughs> test... Axe. Cryak and the Elemis died on their way back to their home planet. <laughs> they both went out for cigarettes and ran off and got married. <laughs> now they're living on Archive of Our Own forever. Yeah. So there's a couple of things. There's one thing that bothered me in the beginning. The way that Axe talked about morphing in the beginning of the book made it feel like morphing is an intrinsic quality of Andalites, and it's not. Mm-hmm. And like, Catherine, you wrote this. You know what happens. Andalites aren't just magical. Well, it's more of an insinuation. Like, they do end up talking about the cube and stuff later. So, like, maybe she just felt like... Like, um, we keep on going back to this one quote, but like, uh, like Stan Lee told Kevin Smith when he started writing Daredevil, every comic first. book... 
is somebody's first comic book. No, I just mean the phrasing of it makes it sound like Andalites are born with morphing powers right. versus okay. them acquiring the technology. It could be in Axe's way of, like, maybe it's metaphorical on Axe's way of thinking. He's throwing, he's trying to convince himself that he belongs with the Andalites more. So in recounting this tale, he's trying to reclaim the, like, the morphing power as being only Andalites, with these five kids being an exception. But now there's probably more, more capable humans than there are more capable Andalites, almost. Like, the, with the rate that they've been, like, adding more members, there's been, it's been so much more. Yeah. So much faster. So that was a nitpick. Also, more and more of the Animorphs are guessing and saying the guesses out loud that Tobias chose to become trapped as a hawk. Cassie mentioned it in 50. I'm pretty sure that Marco mentioned it in 51. And then now Axe mm-hmm. mentions it in 52. And um, in this book, they specifically mention that they notice he's being human more and more, which was a rarity even when he was just hanging out with them. And it's the, he's obviously just doing it to try to hang out with Lauren more, his mom. I think they really noticed it in the last book. But yeah, it's, I know it's definitely commented at some point that yeah. he's in his human morph more and more. Which is like, oh my god, what? I love you. I don't, I don't know. Are they going to have... Because there's a Jake book left, and then... And then that's And then there's it. 54, which sort of the way that... Uh, this might be sorry guys i've gotten spoilered a bit but like the way they describe them on the on the like wikis that i read to get like trivia and stuff about like eh, about these um they mention like this is the last book with axe as the sole narrator this is the last one with marcos so i'm guessing that the last one is going to be a multi-narrator book like the megamorphs you are correct okay. it, it will be a multi-narrator book i don't think that's much of a spoiler to say at this point do Mike. you think we're going to get Tobias admitting that? He sort of talked about it, but, like, do you think he's going to admit it to himself? Hmm. You know what? I don't know. I can't remember. At one point, I kind of thought he would start morphing Andalite more to kind of get more in touch with that culture in his life. But that never really came to pass, I guess. In a lot of ways, it doesn't even now that we're talking about it this is like the first time i've thought of it and we're probably going to say something in the middle of this conversation that makes me completely say oh no i'm a fucking idiot but like in a lot of ways it feels like it doesn't matter that alfangor is tobias's dad oh no you're totally right yeah it's i feel like tobias is on paper the perfect and i read this on tumblr as well it feels like on paper that tobias is the perfect protagonist he is the secret son of Elfangor. Like he had specific, he caught the eye of God, the Elamist. And he's like the kind of moody boy, like, you know, sort of online. He's the main character. And oh, then he's God. just the scout in this one. Like in this story, he's just the scout. And the person that, I, that first wrote this sentiment that I'm sharing and agreeing with, they mentioned that like, that's part of what makes Animorphs so great is that it flips these tropes on its head. It also mentioned Rachel being like the really pretty one. She was always well put together and really into fashion and bubbly and nice and smart. And she's totally fucking ruthless and just can't wait to murder people. Like to kill bad guys. Gets her blood going. She's down for anything. See, that's what I, I, I believe I've said this before, but like that's less of a that's less of a a, a drastic Dis, like departure from from the trope in my opinion like well and i think that's because of recent media with a lot of like oh i'm a secret girl spy and i'm super sexy and hot but also i love to kill which wasn't really prevalent in 90s and definitely not in kids books uh, i would say i'm not saying that necessarily like the black widow sort of archetype i'm saying more the idea of the idea of the pretty popular girl having a brutal streak being like a bit of a big bully yeah and like you know a br- like i mean a bit of like an <laughs> at least an emotional bruiser like we we remember teenage dumb right teenage girls can be so incredibly mean oh and yeah have like a love of brutality so I've yeah seen no enough... i'm kind of with you sometimes they're like no it makes sense that rachel would i've seen like enough this. fighting videos online to know like damn near 60 percent of those things are just girls just grabbing each other's hair and just closed fists slapping each other in the face like i feel like rachel had that energy where she never did anything in school but that's only because she like 
didn't have a reason for it because she knew she was better than you. Like, that would be kind of the energy if you went to school with Rachel in, well, like, I, junior high. I would be like, just wait for this bitch to snap. I never got I, – I don't know if this is, like – I don't know if this is just because I did, I never trusted the narration quite as much, but I never got the impression. I never got the impression from Rachel's description as a character, rather than like the way people described her, that she was a particularly like high and mighty person. Just uh, that I I always pictured her, shaped her in my mind as more down to earth than the visuals of her her yeah. visual identity would shape her as. Yeah, but I think she's also just a very private person. So if you went to school with her, all you would get was a visual identity. I saw some motherfucker online on the one Animorphs page I follow, but like can't really ever interact with because I might run into spoilers, but that's going to be less important coming up here, I guess. Um, say that Rachel, all of her outfits on the covers were not that stylish, even though she's supposed to be the stylish girl. Yeah, I mean, the covers are just bad. Okay? I... Like, the covers are just non-canonical. They're well, non-canonical. She's... Non-canonical! Are you trying to say not a crazy? No, she looks fucking styling on all of them. Okay, well... She's got these slick-ass stripes, some florals. She's got that jean. She's got color. Yeah, no, girl pops. She's, you know what? I made a complete turnaround. She uh, looks the best of out of all of them. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Hey, Brayden, can you let me know what the next segment's about? Why, yes, Tessa. Today we're doing everyday animals. Everyday animals. In this segment, we try to tackle an everyday situation that might have happened in this book. We're doing a bit of a stretch today, but I, I liked the premise too much to pass it up. All the normal rules of morphing apply. No morphing humans, especially. Which isn't something they've held on to at this point, especially now, but... We... Without structure, we'll fall apart. <laughs> we have the structure set in place by the host, Mikhail. And by the law set down by the host, Mikhail, we will apply the structure. Yeah. He doesn't talk on the podcast anymore, but he does actually, um, he's in the corner. Uh, he sits really, he's in a very high chair. Yeah. And the ceilings are kind of low, so he's got to duck his head a bit, but he sits there and he watches us every recording. He's got hi, like this. Hi, Mikhail, do, you, do you want to say hey, hi? Hey. He's got like these no, black he doesn't want to say lifeguard hi. trunks and like a black lifeguard shirt on. And he's got like one of those floaties, but like instead of being wrapped in like a rope for holding, it's like wrapped in like hard barbed wire. It's um, it's a threatening presence, but we need it because we need the rules to thrive and survive. Those Brayden, are the rules. Brayden, what's the question you got for oh, everyday animals? Yes, of course. Tessa. Yes. How would you use morphing to start a successful legal career? Oh. Mm -hmm. In honor of Rachel's mother. Ah, oh, and like what she did with the captain. She did. She really did save the day, considering she's been bitching the whole time. Yeah. Um, and then there was some joke about yuppie lifestyle in there. It was pretty good. I, Kate, okay, to start my legal career, hmm, I would be sneaky. I would be like an alley cat and then maybe a fly on the wall. And I would listen to people, like I'd listen out for people who needed legal counsel. Before this, I would follow a lawyer and like watch what they do to kind of pick up on the vibe. I'd watch a lot of like Law and Order and TV shows to kind of prep for the role. Right. What what sort of morph uh, do you think would be best for spying on a lawyer? I think a penguin. They've already got the suit, so like, you can just walk right in, and they're like, "Yeah, that sounds good to me, Mister." Cool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? What do you think is the what? How would you use morphing to further your legal career? So first things first, uh, in in the legal community um attitude is everything so i would just probably not let myself into a gorilla and just be this <laughs> huge gorilla, gorilla lawyer in a big just be a gorilla lawyer and just flex my way into a you know, pardon for all of my defendants. That's a great idea. What if you could just partially morph? Like, you practice that morphing a lot until you're good oh. at it. Like, Cassie, you partially morph, like, wolf teeth sometimes when you're talking to, like, your opponent. 
and your opponent's witnesses and stuff. And then you partially morph puppy dog eyes when you're talking to the judge. So oh. it plays it easy on you. Oh my God, that's even better. That's even better. Just mass, just practice morphing enough to project whatever attitude you want to. Yeah. And like, who's going to believe you that like, like nobody, your opposing lawyer probably won't even believe themselves that they saw you grow wolf teeth. Yeah, and then they'll be making a bunch of complaints and the judge will get annoyed that the opposing lawyer is making complaints and bringing up weird shit because that always happens in the movies. Oh, the one opposing the main character is always like, the lawyer, the judge hates them. Huh, huh, the judge, the defendant's lawyer showed me his wolf teeth. Silence, order, order in the court. Oh, gosh, oh no. Yeah, I think we would have a stunning legal career, Brayden. What what should we call our legal office if you and I were to start one up? Okay, um, if you and I, Tessa, boop, and Brayden, boop, uh, started a legal practice. Two stock eyes on you. <laughs> Wink emoji. Uh, how about... Something to do with podcasting, because it's literally the only thing that defines me right now in my life. <laughs> I would go ahead and say we would have to name our legal um, our legal team Pod and Cast, Attorneys at Law. We would have to change our last names to <laughs> Cast and Pod. Uh, I'm okay with that. Tessa Pod? Tessa Pod? I'm like Metapod. <laughs> Let's move on to our next segment, shall we? Oh, yes, we shall, Tessa. Why don't you tell me what that segment is? It's called... My Life, My Morph. Gosh, Tessa, I don't remember this one. Could you go ahead and uh, remind me what this is? In this segment, we decide on what the best use of the main morph in this book would be in our own lives. So, Brayden... How would you use a raccoon morph in your own life for purely personal reasons? Okay. If you need suggestions, we were just talking about partial partial morphs and, well, raccoons got hands. They do have those beautiful, sensitive little hands. Hmm. You think you could find a G-spot with those things more easily? <laughs> oh, my God. They also have claws. Right, right. It's not right. what I was talking about, you know. I meant so that you could fill a bowl full of rice and put your hand in it. Feel the cool grains of rice dribbling all over your skin. <laughs> Everyone understands that pleasure. <laughs> Fuck me. Or you just put your hand in a bowl full of tiny little glass marbles and they move around and, chink, 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 and they're that, all cold. Is that your final answer? You would. Um, no, that's not my final answer. I'm just giving you suggestions, you I, dirty dog. I would go ahead as a raccoon and I would just... I feel like this is an answer that we have made and thousands and thousands of our fans have as well, even though we only have like dozens. Uh, <laughs> I would just do cool raccoon shit, videotape it and go viral online and become rich. Cause like, I mean, it's a solid plan. If like basically any time you morph a cute or weird enough animal of which raccoons are both like having pure control over that sort of animal makes you basically a god of the internet like imagine having a grumpy cat that won't die stupidly <laughs> young from being just stressed out all the time because you for you force it to do like stunts that's a pretty good answer my answer would be I follow this comic artist on Instagram, and yeah. she's got a specific handle called Condiment Raccoon, where she draws herself as being a condiment raccoon who just wants to eat food. She threw a birthday party recently for herself where uh, her husband asks, what do you want to do for your birthday? And she's like, I want to go to the grocery store and get whatever I want. And he's like, well, like, you shop for groceries every week don't you do that already and she's like no i am remarkably restrained so she goes all out orders a bunch of food and her husband's like cool so who's coming over she's like oh i guess you can invite people and she just draws herself as this like little cartoony raccoon with a bun on her head and it's the cutest thing and she just like 
I, I love it so much. She's like, should I get peanut butter? I will get peanut butter. And then close up of her phone, her husband saying, no, don't get more peanut butter. We have two jars of it already. It's hilarious. Oh. So I want to be a raccoon and eat a bunch of food. I just want to raid somebody's fridge as a raccoon and stuff my little raccoon belly. <laughs> Fistfuls I, of jam. Talking about it now, I suddenly remember this one other webcomic called um, Sandra and Wu. It was basically like a Calvin and Hobbes thing, but um, it, it was about this girl who ran into a real world, re like a real life raccoon, not like an imaginary friend uh, that she named Wu, and it was like her best friend, and they hung out, and it was this really cool, interesting little fun little comic. Um, and then it turned out that she had a crush on this boy named Cloud, named after the Final Fantasy VII character, and he was like the coolest hottest boy in school and he actually knew how to sword fight and his mom was a badass like ex like eastern east asian like rebel and there was just way too much interesting real life stuff about all the other characters for this comic to be about a little girl and her talking raccoon huh yeah, that was just, that was my third rant of the night, I think. Just me remembering some weird shit I've seen on the internet. What uh, do the friends at home have to say, Brayden? Okay, well, uh, da -da 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 -da. Legend of Z at Dr. Bankruptcy on Twitter says, Eat a hawk with a broken wing. Jash Colze, Jashikins on Twitter, replies with a gif of a hawk, uh, looking absolutely morbid. I'm mortified. There's a couple of people who would think that. I mean, that's the implication anyway. Anthony Charlier at Tobias underscore Orion on Twitter says, Defo got to make sure my food is clean. Yes. Dr. Bankruptcy replies, Tobias objects to that plan. Um, uh, he attaches that gif of a raccoon trying to wash cotton candy, which, and then it just melts. So. Poor raccoon. Fuck that raccoon. The, um, Sarah at Wallybird92 on Twitter says, finally be able to live my natural lifestyle without people judging me all the time. I <laughs> agree. That's basically the same thing that I did. <laughs> Kiara won the Iowa caucus at Kiara Sable says, there can't be a more versatile form to take. You have hands, climbing skill, warm fur, and chonk. Dress yourself in doll clothes and everyone will be so busy ooing and awing they won't even be mad when you steal their wallets and car keys. And I think that that is the correct answer. But we gotta do, we do gotta mention movie polls of here at course. the end. Who tells us this sad and true fact. The raccoon they used for live action reference in the Guardians of the Galaxy and Avengers movies has passed away. Why did they need a raccoon for, like an actual raccoon for reference? Like, it was pretty much, because Bradley Cooper's character had pretty much... A human body just a little furry no it was it was a raccoon, a raccoon head it was a raccoon body that's the thing is they got a raccoon to dress up like marionette style and they walked them around the stage and then just mo-capped bradley cooper's raccoon face on top movie pulls has a better idea than that right, though right, he sorry. would replace this raccoon with my human mind i'd be able to follow all commands and make that disney mcu paycheck nice it's a good answer. It's a good answer, movie polls. I'm going to be quite honest with you, though, movie polls. Disney is just going to, you know, torture that fucking animal and not pay it uh, rather than paying you, a, like, a full Screen Actors Guild paycheck. No, I don't think raccoons are covered under Screen Actors Guild, so you might have to do it non-unionized, but that's mm, okay. Right. There right. are resources out there for you. Brayden, yeah. look at the cover of Book 53 for me and throw me some... Predictions. Predictions. We are looking at Jake. He is morphing into an great. anaconda, it's which a don't great big stink. An anaconda, which don't want. I'm. I'm not gonna do this bit. I'm sorry. It's a uh, Jake into a snake. Jake the snake. Oh, wrestler man. guy. Oh. Uh, he's in a very weird position, he's even like from the crouching. beginning on this book. It's like it's he's- a weird side crouch. He's 
full on on his hands and knees. He's got his neck jarred out at a weird angle. Uh, the tagline is, all questions are about to be answered. Oh, and the title of the book is The Answer. Wow. Ooh, that's like, that's such a coincidence. It's almost like they planned that. Okay, okay. Um, This one sounds a little bit more existential, a little bit more kooky, crazy maybe. Uh, I was just saying today we haven't seen or heard from the Elemist or Krayak mm-hmm. in a while. Mm-hmm. I think... Maybe this one, they're going to sort of put a wrap on the, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? More existential battles that they've had to face. Like, may- maybe the Elemist or Cryak, like, probably neither of them will be eliminated. Almost almost definitely not the Elemist, of course. Um, or chased wait, out. Wait, why, why are you saying almost definitely not the Elemist? Is it you think, because he's, he's like, like, he's like. You think good guys unquote, can't the, die? Yeah, certainly not in the face of the devil. What? <laughs> imagine that. Like, imagine. Imagine just... if that's the bet that this book won. Is the god, <laughs> god just dies in front of your devil? Uh, just like imagine, just the Elemis died, and then just like, oh, the last book is just about like all the animorphs being tortured in a hell dimension. <laughs> they go to the Elemis funeral, and then yeah, then they go to the yeah. bad place. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, I think that we are going to quickly before the end end of this series where they wrap up their more earthly matters probably move on a little um i don't know how long 54 is but if it's an extra long copy like probably they could get into not only the final earthly battles but like also the um they're like after lot their lives after the war so that might be something Ooh. i think here is where we are going to end the krayak elemist battle at least as far as it applies to earth and to jake and to rachel and to the animorphs bum, bum, bum. i guess we won't know until we find out next week yes. if you just can't wait until then well you're in luck friend because you can find more of our stuff on twitter tumblr instagram or facebook remember to subscribe on itunes or wherever you get your podcasts or else god's gonna die my name is Tessa, the expert. And I'm Brayden, the killer of God. This has been God Amorphs, the, ki- the God Killer Chronicles.